not taking it anymore, science officer Sonoris. You told me that those geese were contained to deck 12. Why are they on the what, holiday? What? What's a couple of decks between friends? And when I say friends, I mean everyone on the ship and about a thousand screaming geese. But thanks to Maxi Goose. <laughs> no, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not bringing back Maxi Goose again. No, immediately. I've just had a thought, okay? I've just had a thought now, okay? Was, is Nurse Ogawa the anti-Keiko? Like, as, as the other Asian on TNG, could she have been the force of good that was there purely to hold the evil of Keiko at bay? What, <laughs> what's that got to do with geese roaming on my ship? I'm trying to distract you because they're on the bridge. <laughs> oh, shit. They've got to the bridge. <laughs> Space. The final frontier. These Honk. are the voyages of what's Come left of the Come, my children. Honk. These are the voyages. Our time is nigh. These are the voyages of what's left of the USS Adequate. Our ongoing mission until we are cancelled and replaced by something far superior. To review what every overwhelmed episode... by geese. To review every episode and movie of Star Trek in existence. To seek out new guests and make them very uncomfortable. Honk. To Honk. boldly go where many other Star Trek based YouTube shows have gone before. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good recording, everybody. <laughs> It is not live, but it is trekking up north. I am your host, Captain Goodwill. And joining me, as ever, is the delectable Gysian <laughs> from the planet Honk. <laughs> the emissary he, of the anti Keiko. He is deranged. <laughs> he has amassed an army of geese on my ship. There is poo everywhere. There is feathers everywhere. There is breadcrumbs everywhere. I, I've engineered, I've engineered tiny geese, like microscopic geese that can get into your blood cells and transform you into a geese, a goose. Nano no, geese. no, no, multiple geese. You turn into multiple geese at once. Such is, is my evil genius. He is the Khan of geese. <laughs> <laughs> it is science officer Sanois. And holy hell, what an episode of Star Trek we have got this week to review science officer Sanois. This is a classic. This it's is a good this is it's a rat good and it's one of, this is one of the best episodes of the next generation, and it spawned one of the greatest Star Trek series ever made. That had yeah. the moopsie. The moopsie. I mean, moopsie. this is the thing, though. Like, Lower Decks, as an episode, uh, is... Like, it's what I said when we got um, Candle Slag. It's the idea of, like... In Season 7, it just felt like they knew the show was coming to an end. And they were like, let's try all the things. What are all the plot lines we never got to do that we always wanted to do? And obviously, someone wanted to make a Scottish ghost story. Because, I don't know... Dinner touch a candle! <laughs> too much Maxi Goose, maybe. But it's the uh, the the fact that this is an amazing one. This is literally like, what are the other crew members like? Like, and the whole episode is like a soap opera. The whole yeah. episode is literally like a sort of like, you know, the stuff that doesn't usually happen in Trek. Like, it kind of comes out in like DS Nine and stuff, where it's more sort of you know, and like where there's relationships discussed and things. But like in TNG, it's basically like Troy and Riker, like were post relationship but it never really did anything they from were there tromboning <laughs> oh daddy but um uh but you know it doesn't really go into it and then this one has loads of small talk it has loads of characters talking about like their feelings it has a lot more about the interper interpersonal relationships between our main like our protagonists and each other and other members of the crew and whatnot and it's great it's so good it it fleshes out the crew of the Enterprise in a way that I don't think had been done previously, where it it it, it, it introduced us to new characters who were likable, fully fleshed out, mm. and it brought back characters that you never thought you would see again. And it, it developed 
um, those characters that have been in the background, like Nurse Ogawa. So mm. this was an all-round brilliant episode where it was like, what would, like, how would... It, it, when you look at the a normal Star Trek episode, everything that happens, it involves the senior staff. Everything that the plot develops involves the senior staff. This sort of asks the question... What would the lower deckers do? What would the, the, the ensigns do? What would they know? Like, what would... How would a day in the life of an Enterprise crew member go if we saw it through their eyes? If if we saw a major Star Trek story from their eyes, not from the audience's eyes? And this is what we see throughout this episode where we see them going about their day-to-day -day lives, how they want a promotion and how they are, you know... Uh, mm. Lavelle is anxious. Seto is anxious because Riker and Troy are discussing promotions and who's going to do we, what. And, and this then, is the sorry. And th and then you see a major plot develop as a not even a B plot, a C plot. Yeah. Where it's like you see Picard and he's like Riker, we set a course for uh, Helm, set a course for for this system, maximum warp, and you're like, oh, what's going on? And but then you don't know. What's this going is, on? This is what's genius about it because it allows, like, we don't realize this, but Trek is, well, you know, Trek and most shows are always the main protagonists get to speak for themselves. So all of their definition comes from them themselves, yes. whether they're specific actions or their specific sort of like words. Um, and then in this one, we basically get to find out about other characters like Picard and like Riker and, uh, you know, Crusher and whatnot from another person's point of view, which yes. doesn't usually happen because they kind of go like, you know, you can have someone talking about a character, but Trek tends to go and most shows tend to go, well, why not just have them say that them say that thing about themselves, you know, like, yeah. And then this one just basically has people go, hey, Riker's a bit of a dickhead at times, you know, or something like that. Or, oh, he's actually, he's unapproachable. And we're like, we would never have ever thought that. And we get to see yeah. Picard being a dickhead. We get to see Riker being a dickhead. We get to see Worf being incredibly kind, which he yes. isn't normally. We get yes. the total flip side of characters. And we get to see Crusher, where we get to see this wonderful bedside manner that we'd always assumed but, you know, but then we kind of go like, oh, actually, she's just a very nice person. And it's it's yeah. wonderful because it's like you can't put this into a normal story when the plot line is, oh, we're being attacked by the Borg. Let's fight them off. You can't just be like, oh, are you going to such and such's wedding? Are you doing this? So, you know, like, oh, you know, what's your relationship like at the minute? You know, and and I think it's wonderful. And like you were saying just then, before I rudely interrupted you, you we... Bastard. We get to find out, like, we get to see a plot develop where we're not privy to it. Yeah. Where the, if this was any other episode, the first fucking line would be like, Stardate such and such. Yeah. We are traveling to this planet. We have a secret mission to do this thing. And this is what it's all about. We would have found out before the opening crawl. And then in this one, because we're focusing something else and we're from someone else's point, point of view, we don't know until the end of the episode what the plot is, which is... Crazy. It's, it's genius because it puts you in the position of an ensign on the ship. It's well, the, the way you were on about Riker there, where it was like, oh, well, Riker's unapproachable. Oh, he's not approachable. He's this, he's friendly. He's this. But then you go, well, no, hang on a minute. We are of that opinion because we know Riker because we have, we understand his backstory. We have seen yeah. his trials, his tribulations. We've These been a fly ensigns, on the wall or a yeah, spider under the table. A apparently. spider under the table. <laughs> These ensigns do not. They have. No, they don't know their superiors the way that the audience does. So they have got the trepidation, the anxiety, where they... they I mean, even in the scene where they're in 10 forward and uh, Ben goes to Lavelle, go and talk to Riker. You've got a lot yeah. in common. You're very much alike. He's from Canada as well. Mm. But even then, it's like, we know he's not Canadian. He's from Alaska. But the lower deckers, the ones who have just joined the crew or don't know them that well, wouldn't know that. So they would, oh, right, okay. Mm. So then you see that awkward interaction and you see them, you see Lavelle wanting to try and bond with his superior officer and, and find like a common ground. 
yeah. and get absolutely ballsed up where he's like, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually from Alaska. And he's like, oh, OK, bye. And you see that awkwardness in his in his in his behavior and his mannerisms and he just walks off. It's what I found interesting, though, and this was this was very good for Star Trek. Although this was like obviously the, the next later on next generation, this was bringing back a minor character mm. from a good episode in season five, where we got Seto. And for those that don't know, Seto is uh, from the episode First Duty, where we see Nova Squad, mm. uh, a squad that Wesley Crusher was part of, and Nick Lacano tried to cover up uh, an accident, uh, tried to cover up a deliberate illegal move at Starfleet Academy which killed one of their classmates and mm. Seto was part of that she was reprimanded on record and she's had to work her way up from that disgrace to the point where she's got a posting on the Enterprise D she has worked hard to get a spotless record over three years and we get a, a wonderful interaction between herself and Picard where all the way through the story, we see like little glimpses of things like Picard saying, head, head for this uh, sector at maximum warp. And you go, that's, yeah. that's near Cardassian space. Yeah, and, that, um, and that's a hilarious thing. We get no context. So literally, yeah. like like we have it with like, uh, what's his name? Sam, we just did it before Lavelle. we started. Um, Sam Lavelle. Like Sam Lavelle is like obviously uh, in, well, what's it called when you're driving the ship? Helm. Helm, yeah. He's on the helm. And he's just like, okay, yeah, plot that course. He doesn't know why we're going there. He doesn't do anything like that. And that's, and it just, like, like I say, it's so fucking clever because it's the writers going, hey, wouldn't it be great to write this kind of episode? And you know that during its heyday, during like seasons three, four, five, you know, they would have suggested this episode and the people would have been like, no, 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 it's too yeah. experimental. It's too weird. But the joy of the wind down of season seven is they got to play around. And yeah. And I kind of love season seven for that, you know, because yeah, it has some crazy experimental but it, stuff, it, but it, it's it, great. It, it represents. Unlike, which is that the same problem with season four of the original series, though? Like, could that have been that they were wanting to play around and that's why it was. I mean, nuts. The, the, there, was, there was talks of a, an Umbenga spin off on a medical ship. Um, mm. the everything like that. Uh, not really know much about season four of TOS. Star Trek Phase Two was was more of the the direction that they were going to go, and that's where most of the information came from. Yeah. But with with this, you see the obviously the day in the life of a Starfleet officer, but you see as Starfleet officers, much like people who are in the army, the navy, uh, any sort of armed forces. They are told to do something. They do it without question because that is their duty. That is mm. that is why they are there. So when Lavelle goes, you know, when Lavelle sets the course, I sir does it, doesn't question it because that's his order. With Seto, when um, uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll mention Torek because Torek the Vulcan, he's very he, he very much wants to much like Lavelle wants to impress his superior officer, who mm. in this instance is LaForge, and he's he's experimenting with uh, warp, warp field efficiency, and I've done this, and oh, I, I'm quite happy to, to, to talk to you about it if you want. Oh, we'll sort it later. And LaForge is just <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, whatever. He's but, over-eager, basically. But then when they find, you know, when they detect an escape pod once they uh, uh, arrive there, Torek does the thing. It's very hard to find. It's a small... Maybe if I could find, you know, if I could isolate a life sign from the escape pod, if I could, if I know the race. And LaForge is like, no one told you to do that. So it's a case of, you see Lavelle, who's just does it without question. And then I, you I see do... Torek, well, yeah. Where, yeah, where he's just like, well, it would help if I knew what I was doing who I was looking for, what is the life form? And the Forge is just like, do this without question. And the shuttle, I, the shuttlecraft scene as well. Well, which, which I think is another aspect to the episode. It's like, yeah. you know, that, that's like a totally separate thing to discuss is the idea of it's how the crewmates interact with each other, but it's also how different types of people interact with like the Starfleet regime, where here we have a very secret mission that people can't know about. And then we kind of go, wow, that clashes a lot with sort of P 
people asking questions. Yeah. And the idea of the like Torek, I think he's a bit of a dickhead, but he's like he's a typical Vulcan. But it's yeah. the idea of does he do anything wrong? I don't no. think he does. Like he the whole thing is he him literally being incredibly good at his job and being able to immediately see through all of the subterfuge, immediately being like, why are we damaging the shuttlecraft? This doesn't make any sense. Oh, the only reason we would be doing this is if this was the scenario. And Geordi's like, you you can't know you're not allowed to know any of this, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then the same with the like the scanning for life signs. He's like, I have stop overworking. You're making it difficult. It's kind of like. If you if you work in a bank and you have someone who's so good at their job that they're immediately being like, why are all the funds being directed in this to this weird account? And it's like, oh, you know, it's you Be require nerd. people to not ask questions to get away with dodgy <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, and, that, and this is the thing, and that's why Torek is is a brilliant engineer because the 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 shuttle the shuttlecraft scene where LaForge is saying to him, Oh, we are we are test we are stress testing the whole Starfleet <laughs> ask us to do this periodically. And he's like, Okay, but I could adjust the phaser so it doesn't actually damage the hull and still yields the same results. And Geordie's just basically like, Shut up and do it the way I asked you to. Yeah. <laughs> but then Torek in his Vulcan genius is like, Okay, and uh okay, I will do that. And LaForge goes, Target this part of the hull. All right, I will move over here. Why is that? Because it's more consistent with weapons fire, which makes it look like that the shuttle pod is fleeing an attack. And Geordi's just like, yeah. "You son of a bitch, you know too much." <laughs> yeah. And it's it's but it's genius. but it's the fact that he, he just works it out. It's kind of like yeah. this idea of you know, and and this this is what bothers me because like while I love like Star Trek and you know I think the Federation is cool, the whole sort of space communism and stuff. I I love that vibe. <laughs> But it does have this whole thing with the Federation where it's still a military thing. No matter what they say, it's the fact of it's still run like a military like institution, like yeah, a navy yeah, it's, institution. It's run like a navy, yeah. And and the and the problem I have is like that whole thing of, oh, we just need people to do the job and not ask questions. And you're a bit like going, I don't really like that. You know, it's like Yeah, yeah. sometimes in in life, in work you need to raise questions. You need to go, hang on, this is a bit dodgy. This is a bit sus. Why are we doing this? And personally, in the last well, like, week, I've done this yeah, quite a lot. But it, you have to speak up because if you find that there is something odd, there is something wrong, it is in human nature to go, oh, no, that's kind of, that's kind of wrong. And here we see cadets doing the job without question asked but then we see those cadets that go no w why am i intentionally damaging a starfleet shuttle yeah if i'm doing it i'm going to do it right which is consistent with this and he was proving his own hypothesis to geordie without directly asking him yeah is this why i am doing it and to turek's credit he is not he does not share what he has done he is he is the only one you know because we know Sito is asked to do something we know Ogaro is asked to do something mm. Tarek is the only one who is not asked to keep this secret by Geordi mm. but Tarek does not say a word the 10 forward scene where Lavelle comes in and yeah. goes what what's going on what why is sick me off like what's going on with it why is Sito with Picard what do you all know something? And Torek says nothing, mm. absolutely nothing. And that is the testament of a Starfleet officer that is raising questions, but it's then not spreading rumors. That is not yeah. that is not fueling the fans of rumor. Because as we all know, if if you've worked in an office, if you've worked in a place where the rumors mm. can be detrimental and can often be. A lot more than what is reality. Yeah. And like, I have huge we, respect for him for that. Don't we have an episode where there's a Vulcan? Is it in Voyager where we have a Vulcan who starts suspecting stuff and then causes loads of shit? I'm sure there's something. I'm pretty I'm sure, sure it's in Voyager. I, I'm, I'm sure there's sure. an episode, yeah. episode in Voyager where we have like a Vulcan who's so sure that he's right about something and he turns out to just be wrong, but they're not telling him. I can't remember, but because I know there's a dickhead Vulcan in uh, Voyager. There but, is because um, he, he requests Pont Far for, for Valana Torres. He, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he but requests it's, um... the mating. <laughs> 
but the, but the, the other thing is the the yeah the fact that all of the lower deckers in this episode like in that scene in 10 forward they all know something so sam knows where they are and where they're like headed to ogawa knows what happened in medbay in in medbay uh sito isn't there but knows of the mission uh and uh tarek knows that they've damaged a shuttlecraft to make it seem as though it's been attacked by weapons fire and you're just like going and it's quite interesting that they they don't sam is the one who's willing to share information he's the but, only one yeah yeah and yeah. but the rest of them are like professional about it but the the other thing is like I kind of like it because Geordie gets angry at Torek, where he kind of says, hey, shut up and do your job. Don't yeah. ask questions. But you do get the impression that he will be rewarded for his, like, genius. Like, you kind yeah. of go, like, you know, further down the line, they're going to be like, you are actually very, very good at your job. Like, in terms of, you know, science. But he it, needs, it doesn't, he he's not learn. punished yeah. for what he, what he, no. how good he is. It's just going, not now. <laughs> you know, it's just... But I, I, I want to talk about the the scene because obviously Sito is guarding sick bay because there's an emergency mm. transport from this escape pod. We don't see well, who, who well, it What is. we should probably do, should we probably do a quick run through of the episode? <clears throat> yes, of course. Because yeah. yes. I, I went off on, but so basically the episode starts and we basically open on uh, some lower deckers. So we've got basically uh, Sam Lavelle, who's like the, you know, Riker kind of, you know, the boimler. Of this, yeah, the, uh, yeah. Well, the thing is, he's not, he's not, he's like, he is like Boimler, but he's not like a joke. He's kind no. of, you know, it's like kind of, he's a bit of a sort of, you know, what's it, chisel chin kind of like, you know, uh, Shatner right, kind uh, of character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, he's he's an ensign. Well, they're all ensigns. We've got Nurse Ogawa, who was be amazing that she gets a proper episode now because she's been in the show since season four and she's like Crusher's assistant and she just movie. randomly pops up, but it's. Yeah. This wonderful thing, because, like, the thing that annoyed me in season one, like, the episode we were just talking about, like, last week, where, yeah, they just kind of had a re revolving door of characters, and you never saw the same engineer twice, you never saw the same ensign twice, and then they just went, no, no, we're going to fix things, we're going to literally get this actor back for one episode a season, yeah. just to keep things consistent with how it would be on an actual ship, <laughs> you know. Uh, and Nurse Agar is someone who, like, we've always liked, but they've not re really got much screen time. So we get full stuff here. And like you were saying, we have Sito, who is a Bajoran, mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, in that episode where she got kicked out of Star uh, Starfleet. Well, she got reprimanded in she Starfleet. Got reprimanded, yeah. Uh, because of doing the, what was it called? The, the, the Novan? Covert, covert Starburst. Yeah, the Covert Starburst, which was basically a flight maneuver that would have been really great had it paid off. Yeah. And it didn't, and one of the actual uh, members of their team got killed, and then they covered up the death. Yeah. Uh, and this is basically, a this is like a second contact, if you will, of that plot line. And then the other one is obviously Tarek, who we've been speaking about, who is a Vulcan, who I don't know if we've seen before. No. This is the Have only we episode yet? we see him. Yeah. So it's a, these four friends, and then the barman uh, who works at 10 Forward, uh, Ben, who basically works as an intermediary, but intermediary between the lower deckers and our standard characters so basically they're all wait they're all in 10 forward while troy and riker are going over the crew evaluation reports in all and they're all basically stressing because they're going oh i'm wanting a promotion and they're deciding it now uh you know like you know and then and it's just throughout the whole episode we get these juxtaposes between like you know riker and everyone talking about things and then what the crew think they're talking about and yeah, it's two world thing. Yeah, basically, and then effectively, they're just basically talking about how they all want a promotion. Are they going to get it? Who's going to be up for the promotion? And just general gossip like that. And we move between the relationships between the these characters and different people. So we get to see Ogawa and Crusher effectively having a girls chat and stuff, talking about like, you know, Ogawa's boyfriend and whether they're going to go serious or whether he's cheating on her or something. Uh, and then we have, like you said earlier, we have like, Sam trying to cozy up to Riker and trying to trying to shake off the fear of him, like yeah. 
Because Riker sees it as him being sycophantic and him kind of trying to get a promotion by like cozying up to him. Mm -hmm. But effectively, Sam is just like, I am terrified of this man. And I kind of want to alleviate that fear. But he never phrases it that way. He just kind of goes, hey, I need to stop being terrified of this guy who is my boss. It's it's sort of like it's it, it's it's almost like hero worship in, to an extent because if you put yourself in Sam's shoes, like I mean in real life, if if I saw Jonathan Frakes, we all know he's a nice man. We all know he's a mm. funny man. If you see Jonathan Frakes, you would be intimidated because he's mm. Jonathan Frakes, <laughs> and it's very much the same of you have got a post on the Enterprise. Your CEO is Commander Riker, and by this mm. point, they have done. The Borg, they have, you know, seven years in deep space. Yeah. These people, at this point, they are heroes. They are on the Federation flagship. You would be intimidated. And we see Sam try and not cozy up, but try and sort of break down that barrier of the fear of Riker, but also get to know him and have Riker get to know uh, Sam. And I love the juxtaposition between how Sam fears him and then how Troy just rips Riker by going, he's very much like you. And Riker's basically like, no, he's a kisser. But he's like, no, he's he's, he's very much like you. He is afraid of you. And he's like, I, why Why is he afraid of me? And it's like, I'm, well... I'm going to say that but that scene there is the best scene in the whole episode for me. The poker, the poker scene. scene. Yeah. Because we get, what we have is we have two games of poker going on at the same time. So we basically yeah. have the lower deckers all playing poker against each other with Ben the bartender. And then we have the uh, the, the tr- typical crew, Sam, no, well, Picard never does it, but the typical no. crew were basically Geordie, Worf, Troy, Crusher, Riker playing poker against each other. And they're discussing everything as they're playing, and it cuts between the two of them. So it's it's so fucking well done. Like yeah, it, really so it basically good. has like Crusher asking a question, and then Tarek the Vulcan in the other game continuing it. You know, like and it cuts as though it as though they're in the same room together talking about the same subject. Because obviously Riker is basically going, "Hey, this guy's trying to suck up to me," and then Troy cuts him down, being like, "That's what you used to be like. You need, you know, that's yeah. that's what you were like when you were here uh, in at his stage and stuff like that. And you weren't deliberately trying to cozy the, up to them. You were just, and then Riker, and then." Yeah, and then Riker sort of saying to Worf, like, hey, Sito, I don't think she's suitable for the promotion and stuff. What you know, and then Worf being like, Well, actually, and then it cuts away and then cuts back, you know, to the other team, and then cuts back to War uh, Riker and he's like, Oh, well, yeah, I'll take it. So we don't get to see what right what Worf said, which is it's... you know, cheeky, cheeky script writing, but um Segu- it's segway. just genius the whole scene. And then at the end of it, when the of uh, when the lower deckers finish their poker game. We get to see Ben leave his room, go to the other poker game, and then sit with them. So we get to see that like Ben is this narr- narrator carrying mm-hmm. us through the thing who knows all the sides of the story and stuff. And you can see that he's, without helping, like his unspoken thing is that he is helping all of them because he knows everything, but he's not allowed to tell them outright. So he's yeah. like, hey, Riker, you know, like, this guy isn't trying to cozy up to you, but I can't tell Riker that, so I'm going to suggest that. And, and at the end, we have a wonderful scene where he basically says to Worf, hey, you need to go over there and sit with them. Don't be, you know. And it's a shame. That's what's wonderful, why they did, like, a series of it. Because, like, this... You could have continued this. You could have yeah. happily done a spin-off series with these characters, because Ben's an amazing character that we only get to see for a bit. Tarek is difficult, because he's a pure Vulcan, but... Mm-hmm. He would work as a character. He'd be like the um, oh, what's it called? You know, in the Big Bang Theory, it's got the the, you know, the 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 blatantly autistic one, uh, Sheldon Cooper. Sheldon, yeah, he's like yeah. the Sheldon. That's the role he would play within the series. Is he would just be like the comic relief, but also the sort of dickhead, you know? <laughs> yeah, the stoic comic relief in a way. Yeah. Um, I I want to talk about Worf. Mm. in this episode because we see it we see a different uh we see a different side to Worf mm. in this episode where he has took Sito under his wing if you will yeah we we have mentioned she's a security she's in she's security in, isn't she's she? insecurity yeah. yeah and he is taking her 
under his wing and she because she is up for the ops position and she doesn't know why as as well as sam they are both up for the same position and she just doesn't know why why is she up for this operational position she's in security she, she's good at that and he he admits to her i put you forward for that position and she doesn't ask this is what i loved about it. she didn't ask why she didn't say mm. well i'm not good enough she just immediately looked at him and said i will not let you down yeah and i love that and i love that wharf all the way through although he can't say why he's doing what he's doing he is he is molding her for this mission he is training mm. her for this mission same with picard when picard gives her a a massive dressing down earlier in the episode where well, i i, I want to i want to discuss that scene in yeah yeah absolutely depth later, yeah but, but it's but, but we see this entire different side of wharf where <laughs> he's a parent and <laughs> it's 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 I know. I know. just alexandra the side being like Daddy, he's father, father? i need food Father. father, do you not love me, Father? Why, why did you drop me off in Belarus? Um, I, so... I just love the idea that, like, you know, like when you know when Wolf finds out Alexander's alive, and it's like, oh, you've been living with my parents. Oh, I thought I teleported you into space. Yes, <laughs> um, but we see that we see that parental angle come out of Wolf, uh, and then that that great scene at the end. But yeah, let, let's discuss the, 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 the two Picard scenes with Seto because mm. I... this is the biggest thing. We get to see Riker as a dickhead and we get this kind of justification in it. But but it's like a kind of character assassination in just how nasty Picard is in this one scene. Like it's this yeah. idea because and it's the, the wonderful. Wow. We get, you know, like he we get to see our regular crew as antagonists or as more human than they normally would be. Like like you're saying with Worf, we get to see Worf being really kind and he's not. He's I... not usually kind. He's not usually yeah. a supportive person. And then it's and it's that difference. It's like how you how you can have it at work where you get people at work who are proper serious, where they're just like, hey, I'm here to do my job. I'm not a very nice, you know, I'm not a very sort of Ch you know happy chappy person or talkative person and then outside of work they can be like the craziest party animal in the entire world and then you have yeah. the other one where they're just they're they're not a particularly nice person but at work they'll be making jokes and stuff like that or they'll be very personable but actually they're not really they're a bit cold normally and it's and it's that the fact that all the characters flip and especially picard in this scene where basically he's heard about wharf going hey you know, obviously there's more to it because of the mission, but basically he makes it seem like, hey, Worf's come to me, he's put your name forward that this for you to get this promotion. Do you think you deserve it? And then she's like, you know, oh, blah, blah, yes. And then he's like, yeah, but what about what happened at the Academy? You yeah. got, you, you got one of your fellow crew, uh, one of your fellow teammates killed and you tried to cover it up. You know, you actively lied and tried to cover up, cover this up and like mislead his family, like yeah. totally tears into her and then gives her a chance to explain herself. And she basically does explain herself very well, I think. Like what I the note I've got down is that she actually does just go, you know, she claps back and it's really good. And he's just like, I don't give a shit. Get out, yeah. you know, practically. She, she takes accountability for her actions and yeah. she claps back with, I have taken accountability. I have owned up for this. And I have worked from the bottom all the way up to the Enterprise, to the flagship. And I am proving myself. Mm. And the, there's a great, uh, there, there's a great, like, uh, what was it? Does she ask in the first scene, if mm. you if you had no faith in me, why do you want me on the Enterprise? Or was that, or was that no, in the it's, second It's the later one. It's the later it's one. Basically, sorry, Karen. Yeah, but it's, so she, her defense is calculated. It is calm. She does not react to the dressing down that she is getting. She justifies her actions, mm. which all power to her in this. Because yeah. if y y you've had this, Picard has got a reputation 
within within Star Trek universe. He's got this reputation. He doesn't like children. He's very stoic. Mm. He's very standoffish. He he shows no emotion in front of his crew. So he has yeah. got this. He has got this persona of he is the the captain. He is this legendary commander who does not take shit from anyone. He keeps himself to himself and he is very closed off. So we see that angle first. And then we see all the way through the episode where Seto is uh is is mentored by Worf. Um mm. and we see where Worf is like he he takes her through this test, this martial arts well, test. Like I, I love this because basically what he does and because I, I this is really sus, sus. Like I literally yeah. wrote down a note being like, this is the most suspicious fucking rapey thing in the entire world. <laughs> you know, imagine just put yourself in this fucking position, goodwill. Like literally, you're you're just there, and like what your your boss basically just says, okay, here's a test that you've never heard of that you can't prepare for, you can't actually go off and tell anyone about, and it requires you to put a blindfold on. And then do crazy stuff with me. Yeah. And I'd just be like, Hello, mm. HR. You know, <laughs> it's, the, the, the whole scene, I'm just like going, Were the writers genuinely like, Oh, yeah, this is totally fine. This, this is, is this not is totally normal. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, to be fair, the, the, the first part of the test is how gullible is fucking Sito. Yeah. And then we're like, Okay, cool. We're proving that she's gullible as fuck. She might be suitable for the mission. But, um, but then, yeah. And, and then basically what the test is, is they're basically, they've just finished a martial arts class. Uh, Worf goes, hey, I'm going to do a special test because I think you're ready for it now. And then puts the blindfold on her and then basically attacks her like while she's blindfolded and then shouts at her because she's not able to defend herself. She's not able to block him because she can't see him. And then eventually, after being thrown to the floor a couple of times, she just takes the blindfold off and says, hey, I'm not doing this. It's not fair. Yeah. And Wolf basically goes, that's the test. The yeah. test is owning up and having the strength to complain when something is unfair. And he means this as a parallel to what Picard has just said to her, yeah. where Picard has said, hey, I'm going to judge you for this thing that was out of your control at the time that you tried to do your best with and that you've been paying reparations for since, but I'm still going to like, you know, limit your life because of it. Yeah. And ma making her basically go, yeah, that is unfair that he's doing that after I've tried so hard. Yeah. And it gives her the strength to basically go back to Picard and go, hey, actually go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, you know, it's she does brilliant, but, but it is but brilliant. That's the thing. It's like, and it's that test and you wonder if it's like, it feels like Worf is kind of nudging her on being like, because I, because the, because we leave the first scene with Picard thinking badly of Picard because yeah. it's painted that way, because it's painted from her point of view, yeah, which is the narrative, you know, that's a, the narrator that we have for this scene rather than usually Picard. Hmm. Uh, and then when that, hap when that happens, he, it's because he is expecting her to clap back he is expecting her to complain about how unfair it is and say hey actually i deserve to be treated better but she doesn't she just takes it and this is like sam where it's the fact of sam isn't going to get the promotion off Riker because he is being a fucking pushover yeah in that kind of weird way and it's the you know and then it's the fact that Worf helps her over that thing anyway so yeah i'm going on but no but, but then it's, it's... in the second scene picard basically goes Right, that's exactly what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to hold me accountable for judging you for these yeah. actions that happened years ago. I just needed to know that you were over it, that, you know, you were past, you know, that. Yeah, and it, it takes a lot of courage for Sito to go to the captain of the ship. And the question that she asked, you know, if, if, if I wasn't worthy of wearing the uniform, why am I on your ship? Mm. Um, and we we get this twist at the end of the scene where Picard goes, "I wanted you. I asked for you um, to be on this ship to give your to give you a chance to redeem yourself." Mm. Which, again, 
a, juxtap- uh, a, a juxtapose from the first scene where he goes, wow, Picard was a, a really harsh captain yeah. and really nasty to this person who held her own and, you know, wants to show... Wow. And then you get this twist where he's like, no, he, he was... It was a test. It was a test to see if she had the courage to stand up for herself, to take accountability for her actions and, you know, to, to show that she is worthy of the uniform. And she does that. She comes back. She 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 doesn't get summoned. She doesn't do it. She goes straight to the ready room and yeah. defends herself and proves herself. And we just see that it was a facade by Picard. A facade. A Picard facade. <laughs> a Picard facade. Picard facade. <laughs> um, that he, he, he was testing her like Worf was testing her. And we then get to see the overall main plot of mm. the episode where Cito's... Well, I, I, I just wanted to mention before we yeah. move on from that is the idea of this is like we learn through mindfulness techniques or whatever, which is all about not how you don't know what other people are thinking, like mind reading. And it's the idea of just because someone acts a certain way, we can't assume how they're feeling. We can't yes. assume their intentions from it. And a lot of anxiety and a lot of like distrust of others, well, purely the whole point of distrust, is based upon us believing we know their intentions. Yeah. And the idea of her leaving with this bad view of Picard is because she's going, oh, he's being a dick to me. She's not thinking about you know, his inner motives or stuff like that. He's yeah. She's not thinking about, like, the actual context of what he's doing because she doesn't know. And it's this... And th- she doesn't know about this mission. She doesn't know that he holds her in such high regard and that's why he's testing her. Yeah. And therefore, she walks away with a bad opinion of him. And this is something that we can apply to real life where the amount of times where you'll... I know you're, like... I used to have it when I was sort of really bad that like I'd bump into a friend in the street and I'd say hi and they wouldn't, they'd just blank me or something yeah. or I'd wave to someone and they'd blank me. And then just crazy stuff like where you realize, oh, wait, yeah, they're, they're long sighted, aren't they? So they, well, no, no, I think it's short sighted or something, but it's the idea of, oh, they can't actually see that I was waving at them. The... But to me, I thought, you know, they were just staring because they're looking directly at me and they blank me and stuff like that. And then, you know, and, and, you know, that kind of thing. Or they're having a terrible day and they're like, oh, sorry, I didn't say hi to you in the street because I was on, I was in a rush or I was having a terrible day or I was just going to moan at you if I'd seen you and stuff or I was having an anxiety attack. All these things that we can't know from our, like, interactions. And that the important thing is not making our own, like, like not, not, not doing things based upon what we believe other people mean. So, because it'll backfire. Yeah. So, so, so to to riff off that. <laughs> I, sorry, I've got no, 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 no. I'm, I'm no, I'm going to continue the tangent because <laughs> I have a reputation for having a resting bitch face. Okay, you've gone quiet, dear boy. You've I've got, got one quiet. on mine. There we go. There, yeah. Yeah, I keep thinking I've got because my my standing face is literally like this even though i'm really happy this is, this it's is just my because thing. i'm listening. when i am working this is how i work that's it that that is my face right so i've got this reputation of apparently having a resting bitch face now on top of that i am a fast walker and mm. as i have lost the weight i have got faster so <laughs> right <laughs> I could walk it's, up. Yeah, it's speedy I, goodwill. It's speedy goodwill. And 60 I, so I, miles I, an hour. So not only do I have a resting bitch face, I also have a reputation as someone who stomps around the office. And the amount of times I had to say when I first started, and even as recently as a few months ago, where I'm not angry because people go you're angry you always walk around the office with a scowl on your face and you're stomping around and i go no i'm actually okay i'm fine i just have this type of face that looks like i'm angry all the time and i'm a fast walker i'm not stomping i'm not moody 
it's just how but you can see how people have the, the people that don't know you that well have that misconception of you whereas mm. my colleague even my colleague will say to people they'll go to her and say oh he's in a mood today isn't it and she'll go no 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 he's just got that type of face and he's a fast walker and yeah. it's like you you try i can i'm not that type of person where i could just walk around the office going hello all the time because this just we, fucking we, this is the thing like I, yeah. and I, I I have it where, you know, there's a level of insincerity that you don't want to put across, like especially in office, because you do get people who are like that. You want to be and honest. And they are just absolute twats. Like, yeah. you know, there's yes. where I work, there's one guy and he's like, he genuinely, he's like, I'm not going to tell you his position because people could find out. But basically, he's in, a, he's in a position where he has to cozy up to people, mm. but in he does it in the most blatant, horrible way where it's the most blatantly disingenuous thing yeah. ever and you're and sitting there being like how does nobody like yes. everyone he's talking to must know that he's just fake as all shit and i'm just like does that not harm his job like yes. when his job is to like co you know when, like when you can you see know. someone is transparent people like me and sonoy's can sit there and we can detect it we can sense it where someone is being disingenuous not deliberately you know, overly mm. fake to be nasty, but when they are being disingenuous to get something done and you go, how can no one see that? How can no one else see that? And for me, I'm always, I am always honest. I am not nasty. Mm. I am just, I am honest. I am honest in the way I look, I way I dress, the way I walk, the way I do my job. And it's not to be nasty. That is the way... I have been trained, I have been raised, because for me, I'm not sycophantic. I don't want to cozy up to someone. I'm like, hey, we're here to do a job. Let's mm. work together to get it done. We might not like it, but it needs to be done. So well, I, 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 I'm I, the I would, honest type yeah, when it comes but, to that. But that's what does best. Like, yeah. like in, in experience, it's the idea of when you meet like people, like famous people or whatever, if you're sycophantic, they just go, you know, they can see like, it. If, if, if they respond well to someone being sycophantic, it suggests they're not a good person. Like the mm. people I found, like the, pe the people I found where they do respond to being worshipped are the people who don't stay famous for long, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. but... It's the it's the fact of like you know the other people where if you just treat them like anyone else and you just kind of you know like you just kind of go oh you know how is your day what 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 food do you have and you know oh, could you recommend places here or whatever you know those kind of conversations they're the ones where you just like oh okay and that does better that does it's far it's better than it's it's hilarious because obviously we do this show and we are unhinged and we drink cocktails and we come up with mythos like a Picard facade or Keiko is all the real most evil, or, or Keiko is the most evil villain in the world. Seal him, uh, seal him. Oh no, that's what Ogawa would say because it's miles backwards. Um, so it's basically because she's the anti Keiko, she's the force of light on the Enterprise. But then, obviously, at work you are more professional and then it's really funny because again my colleague she's like you looked unapproachable you looked moody and scary but mm. when they when people i mean i do i do go to work in corpse paint so it does yeah, probably help but <laughs> it's saying clown posse right here but when you <laughs> um <laughs> please tell me good real you just go to work and you're just like a fucking juggalo <laughs> it's like Oh, it's Juggalo Tuesdays. <laughs> All black, white, yeah. Um, but but, uh, and this 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 happened at previous shows. But then when people get to know me, they go, "Oh, you you're actually a deranged motherfucker." That's really funny. And it's like, yeah, but that that like not facade, but that that image that is portrayed does not represent that person. And we are taught that in, in mindfulness, like you said, that the the way that someone looks the way that someone behaves is not inherently a, an accurate portrayal of that person and we mm. see it as an audience of the next generation we see it of commander Riker. we yeah. see it of jean-luc picard but we also see it as 
a lower decker where they go, oh, God, no, Captain Picard wants me in the ready room. I'm terrified because the image that he portrays is like uh, yeah. Picard maneuver, stoic, emotional as I am. I am captain of the flagship. And, and then... Yeah, you would be terrified yeah. of Picard, you know, like yeah. for exactly the reason said. Same as Riker, where it's like, you know, the bit we get in this where Riker, like, you know, I think sort of Sam say sort of like, aye, 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 commander. And then Riker just goes like that, you one know, eye. One, one eye will be sufficient. And he's just like, what a fucking dickhead. Like, yeah, you know, and, and but that, that the whole tangent we had there, the whole discussion there is how wonderful the writing in this episode is that it basically allows that to happen where we yes. basically get to see all these characters through a different lens can seem totally different yes. so even though we usually get the sort of their inner thoughts and we usually get sort of them with all of their walls down effectively this is how they might be perceived by someone else the same as me and you would be perceived and whatnot yeah. so it's it's Graham that idea I was of a like, dick when we first started this and he's just like he's, he's still a dick yeah, it's like <laughs> my opinion has not changed. But... Nope, I I was right. <laughs> you, you thought you thought I was serious when we started this. No, I still am. <laughs> but no, the the sh shall we get to the the overall uh, yeah. story of what happened? So, so the the actual like you say, it's framed like a C plot, but yeah. the actual plot of the episode that we would know if we were following the main protagonist if it was an actual proper yeah. star trek episode yeah is that the enterprise has been ordered to this region of space which is near the Cardassian border they have picked up an escape pod uh within this escape pod there is a Cardassian mm. um and it is revealed that he is not only a part of the the Cardassian uh what do they are they Cardassian order or I, I, I don't, don't know because the problem is it changes because in DS9 obviously they get like they start off they get overthrown then they join the Jumi Dominion so you're just like I don't even know what so the, Cardassian so Union is what it's the started The Cardassian as. Union yes yeah. so he's a soldier in the Cardassian Union um, but he is also a Federation operative and it, th at this point in Star Trek DS9 is only in season two and the Cardassians are still a bit, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're not part. They are they part of the Federation? They have no, a treaty. No, they're not part of. They, they yeah. have They have like a a, a, a standoffish treaty with yeah. the Federation, um, but they which still is the same doing... as the Klingons because the Klingons yeah. have the uh, oh, what's it called? The, the Kitchener Accords. Accords. Yeah, but the, the the Cardassians at this start are still doing so shit. We've got the Marquis. We have got these these unsanctioned skirmishes that they are doing to basically they are being dicks. So yeah. he is an informant for the Federation and he is delivering vital information to the Federation to prevent any skirmishes, to avoid any conflict and, you know, ultimately to avoid any wars. Mm. Um, he needs to return back to Cardassian space in order to keep up the facade, Picard facade, that he is you know, a loyal Cardassian soldier. But in order to do that, he needs to portray that he has captured a Bajoran terrorist and he has stolen a Starfleet shuttle. And the way he's done that, he has stolen this shuttle and it has been fired upon by the Federation, uh, as you can see by these phaser marks on the hull. And he barely mm. got back with these Bajoran terrorists who he has captured. Yeah. So everything that you see throughout from the lower deck side, why are they shooting on a shuttle? Why is Nurse Aguara being told to be quiet? Why is Seto guarding the infirmary and no one but the season officers? And it all becomes yeah. power. It all be it all falls into place. Um, and the last piece of the puzzle that we need is that they want Seto. They they ask her to volunteer to be the Bajoran terrorist within yeah, they... within this plan where. If he gets across the Cardassian border, talks his way into getting through, he will then re-release her in an escape pod and throw her over into Federation space because an escape pod is too small to be detected by Cardassian sensors. Which, to be fair, seems very sus. It seems like yes. a slight plot, you know, a plot it's hole. A plot but hole, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But um, they ask her if she wants to be, if she wants to do this. And without hesitation to Seto's credit 
she volunteers. She agrees. It is an incredibly risky mission. And Worf, again, plays the par the parental role. Worf plays a protective role where he goes, this is, this is an incredibly dangerous mission. You are putting yourself at risk. And without hesitation, again, she accepts the mission. Mm. And it's, it's heart-wrenching to see the conclusion of this episode where... They're in this shuttle, but and she's so go on. It's a it's a wonderful scene because we get a scene basically because obviously this is it must be a bit weird because normal it doesn't really go into it in this episode. But obviously, if you've been watching DS Nine, you'd mm. know obviously that the Bajorans and the Cardassians have a terrible relationship with each other because Bajor has been like occupied by the Cardassians for the last like fifty five years yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, so we have this wonderful scene between this, like, Cardassian, like, you know, he he says he's not a traitor. Well, that's what happens in the scene. So he's basically he's a Cardassian informant and uh, a Bajoran, like, Starfleet officer. And they're, they're basically just talking to each other, like, as equals and learning about each other. And, you know, her being like, wow, I didn't think a Bajoran would do this. And she's just... And she's like, I didn't think, why would a Cardassian sort of be a traitor? And he points out, like, I'm not being a traitor when I'm doing it for the good of Cardassia, where it's yeah. this idea of why are we doing all these stupid military things? Like, why are we spreading ourselves so thin for, like, pointless territories and things like that? Like, and he, he and it's this idea, it's like, it's the same as Garrick, where it's basically this sort of, he has his own loyalty because he loves Cardassia and he realizes how bullshit it is. It's like me saying, fuck the Tories, which I will say quite a lot, like, fuck the Tories. Tories. And people are like, you know, if you complain about the government all the time, oh, you're anti-British. Or if you complain about our foreign policy, then you're anti-British. If you complain about, there we go, hey. You know, and it's like, no, I'm complaining about this shit because I fucking love Britain, because I love being British. And they are destroying it. And that's exactly what his motivation is to be, and in, you know, like a, you know, they class it as a traitor, we'd see it as a patriot. Hmm. And, you know, and it's very much this wonderful scene between them. But, uh, you know, which ends in basically him going, okay, cool, we're approaching it now. And then she kind of sits down, she puts a gag in her mouth, and then he handcuffs her so that it looks like, you know, she's a prisoner and whatnot. Yeah. And then we don't see Sito again. No. The next thing we find, that, the next scene we see is the lower decker, the remaining lower deckers, in 10 forward discussing like where she's gone what could have happened and that's what we were talking about earlier where they're trying to put things together but ogawa can't talk about what she saw in a sick bay uh tarek can't talk about what he found out about the shuttlecraft and sam can't talk about where they are why they're so close to the cardassian border and why they're sending probes into cardassian space effectively yeah. Yeah. uh and then and then we get a tragic scene on the bridge where they send a probe into Cardassian space against the treaty. Yeah. So we see basically Picard, you know, we basically have, you know, they're scanning the, well, they're at the border, they're scanning, trying to find where her life pod is, you know, if she's being fired back. And then they go, we can't find anything. If we send a pod out, it'll break our treaty, but Picard orders them to do it anyway. And then with the extended sensor range, they detect the remains of a Federation escape pod, which has obviously been fired on by the Cardassians after yeah. they sent her back. So the sensors did detect it. Um, and yeah, and she's just dead. And and there's this wonderful, I say wonderful, there's this wonderful um, coldness to it. Like, this is military life. Yeah. Like, this is what signing up to Starfleet is. And it's the other side where we see Starfleet totally flipped on its head, where we're basically going, hey, we're getting to see characters from a different angle. We're getting to see how Starfleet is from a different angle. And then this is the other one where it's like going, yeah, people die. Like, when you were in Starfleet, you're not just traveling around the universe. Every single day, you could die. And that's that. It's... And it's... We don't get to see it in Trek usually. Sorry, it's, it's the acceptance of because we we see this uh, throughout Star Trek where Starfleet officers, for the most part, have this acceptance mm. that um, they could lose their life in the line of duty. 
they you know they are trained for it they they are conditioned to be prepared for the eventuality and mm. it's it's but what we see you know this is like you said this is military life but when we get the 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 boss and whistle uh, announcement from Picard about Seto and we see that family aspect as well because yeah. anyone who's been in anyone who serves anyone who's been in the navy or anything like that you get there's camaraderie there's a family element to it and this is what made the next generation deep space nine voyager really stand out was they were it we had an ensemble but there was an ensemble to the ensemble because you had a crew and they fleshed out the crew all right, you never saw them in every episode. You, I mean, you saw Mr. Mott the Barber, but then you knew, oh, Mr. Mott the Barber, he's a gobshite. So yeah. they fleshed and you, out the You crew. get to see like things like Morn and whatnot. Yeah, you know, like, but what, uh, you we know. See, what we see here and what we saw a lot of in Voyager and Enterprise is when the crew loses one of its own, they mourn, they mm. grieve. And we see this with Ogawa and we, we see this touching scene at the end where Lavelle comes in, Sam... And he has gained his pip, but he can't. He can't be happy about that because he feels he only got the pip because of what happened to Sito, and that he didn't earn it because he feels it should have been given to Sito. And then the rest of them go, "You shouldn't feel like that. You should. You should honor Sito's memory by being the best lieutenant." you can by excelling at your role so we yeah. see them mourn but then we see them su support each other by saying what you know what has happened is tragic but we could honor her memory by being the best that we can in our role and i love that the the final part is ben going over to wharf and yeah, because Worf is Worf is sitting on his own in yeah. ten forward, mourning privately. Yeah. While the rest, while the other three are basically mourning together. Yeah. And he and Ben Ben goes over to him and basically says, "Hey, you should be sitting there with with them." With and friends. he's like, "No, they are her friends. I was her superior officer." Yeah. And Ben basically points out, "Yeah, but she thought of you as a friend." Yeah. You know. And it, and that's the thing, and it's that final bit in the episode which bridges the gap between how how grief perhaps and how emotion how grief can break down separates... the barriers yeah. of of command where you get to a point where yes he's a superior officer but in times of mourning like that rank doesn't matter because they were all her friend her her friends they mm. were all special to her and for Worf to to sort because we don't see this with with Picard Riker Crusher we see this with Worf and again this is a this is a brilliant Worf episode because we see a different side to him we see Worf the protector the pe the parent mm. where we see him take that first step as a superior officer to sit down with the Lola Deckers and you know it's sad that the scene ends there but it's that step of yes there is rank but then we are also a crew camaraderie a family and mm. as a family as a unit we all must mourn together i'm sorry i went full vin diesel for a minute there but it it's it it's, is it's, it's a relevant thing that when you lose one of your own Rank doesn't matter. The pips on your neck do not matter because you're all mourning the same loss. Yeah, no, I, and, that, and that's exactly it. And it's, and yeah, and it's, it's absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And and I, I love that the more we talk about Wolf, we basically just go, yeah, he, he is one of those people where at work, he's a bit of a dickhead to work with because he's a professional, like, and that he is always really serious. Like in DS9, he is so professional to a fault yeah. that people kind of dislike him a bit because they're like oh fucking hell wolf you know 
and it, it's very much kind of like that. But then he tends to be a bit kinder to people he doesn't work with, which is yeah, it's a total spin on things. But yeah, yeah. But basically, that's the episode. That's everything that happens in the episode. And then the fun thing is obviously. If it was a normal episode, we would have been told about the mission from the start. It would have been like Stardate such and such. We are going into te- uh, Cardassian space to collect a Cardassian informant and deliver him back to, uh, you know, to Card- Cardassia. But we are currently looking for a crew member who will be a prisoner for him. We are looking at various members of the crew. However, we're wondering whether, you know, Ensign yeah. Cito has what it takes to actually do this. You know, and that that that's exactly how it would play out if it was a standard episode. I it's oink. I would ask. <laughs> I I would ask because obviously I, my new question is: Do you think this is worthy of a second contact? However, this spawned a series. Yeah. So what I'm going to ask is: Do you think we apart from Cito, obviously, do you need? Do you think we need to revisit? some of the characters and i'm going to say this now do you think we need to revisit some of these characters in lower decks and just see where they are not go into any stories or anything like that mm. but we see you know lavelle sam lavelle ah oh, he's, he's commander of this and just have that little nod and that little acknowledgement because i think mike mccannon quite rightly this was the inspiration for lower decks we see that it's called lower decks but i think i we definitely do okay we definitely do need to know what happens with these characters later (laughs) but the problem is there's a fucking spoiler on the nurse agawa page that i'm looking at in memory alpha which basically says that she becomes the chief medical officer of the enterprise eventually oh (laughs) (laughs) yeah so it's basically yeah it's it's basically a coffin discuss chief (laughs) medical officers of the starship enterprise uh, what is it? Obviously, you know, the Enterprise D, Crusher, Pulaski, Ogawa. And okay. then the Enterprise E is Crusher. Uh, Enterprise NX01 is Phlox, obviously. Yeah, and but it's, it's this idea. Like, that's the problem. Memory Alpha, it's all been fleshed out in, like, sort of beta canon, I guess. But but no, this is actually, no, this is, this is uh, canon, Memory Alpha. So, memory yeah, alpha. so it must be canon. Memory Alpha! Thing, where? <laughs> memory Alpha 5! <laughs> We need to get Joe back. What we need to do, we need to get, we need to get, I love how I just scrolled up and it, yes, I just scrolled up and it just has the episode where it just goes, Ogawa turned into an ape and then it just has a picture and I'm like, I I remember that episode. But the thing is, the thing is, right, this is what I love. All right. Okay. So I've got to rephrase the question. Do we think, do we want to see Sam? Because... I'm checking, for, it. Hold on. For I'm checking his me, page now, so I'll tell you what happens me, to him. We see Nurse Agawa all the way him. up to Star Trek First Contact. Yeah. We see her in Star Trek. Because it's brilliant that this minor character, all the way through the next generation, gets focused in this episode of Lower Decks, is in Star Trek Generations as a very, very tiny minor role, and then again is seen in First Contact. And it's brilliant mm. that they, they continue to have these crew members dotted about, but we don't see Tarek and we don't see Sam. <coughs> I am so sorry. I am on 40 a day. <laughs> I was singing on Twitch. Cigarettes co- or cocks? Yes. I was singing on <laughs> Twitch the other day and I have not recovered yet. Um, I was serenading all the Nerdy Up North members in the Twitch thing. Please, <laughs> please go to Nerdy Up North Twitch and subscribe so I can get my voice back. But um, I don't think we see Sam Sam level. There we go. We don't see him. No, he again. doesn't. Doesn't look like he. He's got a memory beta, but obviously that don't count. That don't, don't count. That's count. beta canon. Uh, yeah. Uh, hold on. In the novel, oh, in the novel series Star Trek: The Dominion War, Lavelle was serving with Tarek on the USS Aizawa. 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 Uh, yeah. 
after the outbreak of the Dominion War. The pocket TNG novel, Behind Enemy Lines, mentioned that Lavelle and others from the ship, what, what was just named, became prisoners of war out of the Dominion and were taken to an internment camp in the Badlands, while the novel Tunnel Through the Stars depicted the return to the Federation and wartime romance with Roland. What? What? Can I do the alternate timeline one? <clears throat> I need to drop a mic. Where's a mic? Hold on. <coughs> In the alternate timeline, illustrated in the TNG Myriad Universe's short story Brave New World, Lavelle achieved the rank of Lieutenant, or as we call it in England, Lieutenant, and was serving as Flight Control Officer on board the Enterprise D by 2378. In that timeline, he was romantically involved with Sito Jaxa. Oh my! Is Sito Jackson? Sito, but she's dead. But not in the alternate timeline. She's alive. Oh, oh she's surprising. alive. That's crazy. But he has a wartime romance with Ro Laren. But isn't she going to be like fifteen years his senior? Oh well, spicy. I mean, you know, whatever, whatever greases the wheel. Well, that um, doesn't end well either. <laughs> technically, if we another, go by the card. Another fantastic episode by the Double Wheel. I think you'll mm. agree. Um, it was great to go into a deep dive analysis about this. Um, mm. I I think it is up there as one of the top 10 greatest Star Trek The Next Generation episodes ever made. I, I think it is the sort of thing where what this did, like you what what happened with Trek? Like the the shadow the shadow of the original series hangs over all Trek, yeah. where stuff that the original series did. The other shows are like, we need to do that. We need to do a Mirror Universe episode. We need to do a court episode. We need to do this kind of episode. And it basically, and this is something that didn't exist in the original series that TNG introduced that should have been in every series, that they should have done a lower, uh, a lower Decks one for <coughs> Deep Space Nine. They should have we done one for Voyager. Voyager. They should have we done one for Enterprise. Voyager. <laughs> we see a, a little tiny reference one of one Voyager. What has happened to your voice? I don't know. I'm dying. I love how you're trying to cure it with iron brew. Damn you, <laughs> This will make things better. Damn you, Keiko. <clears throat> Good. Carry on. It's 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 because this is this the I think this might be the final appearance of Nurse Agawa, so uh it means that Keiko's power is waxing. I require medical attention. Um, Actually, but, she's already moved to DS Nine by now, so there's, yeah, there's no stopping her. Oh yeah, she did. She 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 moved with Miles, yeah. didn't she? Um, she's having yes. a, and then he's just like, please go to Bajor for six months and leave me alone. <laughs> but but yes. no, that that is amazing acting. That is amazing acting by Miles O'Brien. That he's like, oh no, my wife isn't here. <laughs> Time to go to the 23rd century where she can't find me. Anyway. Time to hang out with my mate all the time. Yay. <laughs> Speaking of <coughs> the double wheel, we are getting an incoming transmission. Science I'm going to do that voice. Hello. Are we Are we using our granddad voices? Is that what this is? Back in my day, we, we, had, we had Enterprise A and that was it. <laughs> Right. I, I love that. I love that. I was tormenting Kirky the other day because Kirky was talking about how busy, how busy her life is. Because her her life is chaos at the minute, where she has like you know she has a, a child to look after. She's got a husband who needs some help and stuff. Yeah, her work is going crazy and stuff. And then she was like telling us all about like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do can't do this because of this and stuff. And I'm just like, oh, what? you moan, moan, moan. That's all you ever do. You sweet <laughs> and she's like, I've had two hours to myself this week, and I'm like, two hours, luxury. Look, back in my day, we'd finish work an hour before we'd go to bed, and then our dad would kill us. <laughs> I I did this today. At work. <laughs> I did this today. I said, I don't know what I was saying. There was something like, oh, I'm tired. I went to bed at eleven o'clock, and I woke up at eight, and I'm just like. I work three jobs and I have four hours sleep. And when I'm finished here, I'm going to job number two. And then when I've done job number two, I'm doing job number one. And then I'm doing job number three. And I'm like, I have become my dad. So, <laughs> um, but, 
it, it's just this crazy thing. Like, it's literally like I'll have someone complain at me because they're just like, oh, I went to bed at one the other day and I had to get up at like eight. And I'm just like going, I got in at half three and then I had to be up at seven. It's like I barely closed my Our eyes. Lives are and fueled. then tonight I'm doing it again. Yeah. I don't know how I'm still alive. Our lives are fueled <laughs> by ketamine and fear. <laughs> And it's like, yes, because, you know, we, we, we are hard workers. And I have, I have, even though I've got three jobs. We are I've, dumb is the problem. It's like everyone else who works less than us has a. Everyone has else who works less than us better. gets paid more. So we are doing <laughs> something wrong. Um, <laughs> speaking of, we are getting an incoming transmission. Science officer Sinoise. Ooh. Incoming Ooh. transmission. <laughs> 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 you have a beautiful Oh my scene, lord! Boy. It's a preview for next week's episode of Trekking. Oh lord, oh. lord! Oh my lord! Do you like my fancy warp speed effect? I was going to ask you to 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 look into the look into the crystal ball that is my head and tell us what's happening next. Week. I don't see your head. I see the 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 band of your headset. There we go. There we go. Can you oh. see that? Have you been waxing? Can you do that? There we go. Can would you, you tell like, the future from my bald, you, bald noggin? Would you like to yeah. borrow some turtle wax? <laughs> would you? I'm just gonna use. I'm gonna use Crisco and grease. Have you Have you tried Maxi Goose? <laughs> Maxi Goose is now in Greece form. <laughs> Maxi Goose. <laughs> Dude, I, I I quite like that. If you just sort of like, if you got a product. And just put it in really random stuff. Like, you know, like you just get something that's like, you know, usually sort of like edible. And you're just like, now you can buy it with engine oil texture. And you're like, you why laugh. would I ever want this? You laugh, but there was a WD-40 aftershave and that shit was fire. <laughs> um, yeah. Seriously? Seriously. It smelt amazing. Did it, what, what did it smell of? Like, yes. Okay, so next week. <laughs> okay. It smelled of no, when you say it was fire, are you saying you caught fire no, wearing I, WD-40 I, aftershave? I, I, I just slid everywhere. Um, yes, next week, it is the end of the month, and that can only mean one thing. Me and Sir Noise's journey through the Star Trek movie world is continuing with Star Trek 3. The Search for Spock. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm excited for this because... I don't think I've ever seen this one. Have you never seen this? Genuinely, the this is the thing. It was like Wrath of Khan. I was like the the, the original movie, the uh, the motion picture. I was watching it. and was like I have never seen this. Like I've somehow dodged this. And then Wrath of the Khan. I'm like, oh yep. Yeah, I yeah, as soon as I yeah. started watching, I was like, oh yeah, I know this bit and stuff. This one, I'm like, I have no idea. If you... I start watching this and start thinking, oh, I know this then I'm going to be very surprised because I'm like, I can't tell you what the plot is. I, I was asking you before the show, like I was like going, how do how does Spock come back? <laughs> you know, and it's just Oh, this... guys. He so this is, is going to be a big a thing for me. He is in for a treat. Everyone watching out there, watch the search for Spock. Watch it and then join us next week as I am so happy. Science Officer Sanois boldly goes into watching the search for spock for the first time <laughs> wow this is this is sonoy's part two of the genesis trilogy as it was known this is the wrath of khan search for spock and the one with the whales voyage home mm. this is a self-contained trilogy mm. so i am very excited for you to watch part two of this mm. um I can't wait to hear your thoughts on it as well. well where do, where do they find him? Can you? Well, I know it's spoilers, but is it like behind the sofa cushions or something? They just kind of like they're looking around and they're like they're trying to find something. They're trying to find the remote, and then they just sort of pull on like this ear, and then they sort of go, "Oh, it's Spock!" And he's you like, know where they find him? Where? City Alpha Five. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, wait, he's inside one of the whales from the later one. Like Pinocchio. You are so close. <laughs> it is unholy how close you are. <laughs> wow. Um, no, uh, he's, he's behind the sofa. Spoiler alert. Uh, yeah, com computer, it. go back to the adequate screen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the adequate screen. 
I think you'll find this screen is subpar. I think you'll find that was a mouse click. Um, I, I, I don't want to complain about, you know, the Lacar systems that we have on this ship, right? But oh, I don't, don't think those Lacars. things... Are, like Lacars, yeah. Lacars. Lacars, yeah. That, it's like, yeah. Design, designed by... Uh, it's basically Mac what you call automobiles in France. D designed so. designed by that genius Mike Okuda, as o they call him. Okuda. Not Okuda. 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 Yeah. Uh, I don't think they're doing anything. I could have killed, yeah, killed him. I could have killed him, but I didn't. I could have, but I didn't. I didn't. But I've been looking at that orange line at the top, and that's not doing anything. That's just doing nothing. Look at it. Rubbish. That's what that is. Rubbish. I can speed it up for you if you want. Oh, can you? I can. can you? Oh, he he does this. He does. He does think I do not have the power. Let's have a look here. Then call on. Oh, um, <laughs> no, no, we're not no, bringing Jimmy no, into this. No. Computer, <laughs> I demand. Nay, I request you increase the speed. Oh, 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 my lord, what is going Unlimited on? Unlimited power! Unlimited power! Oh, my, <laughs> that is, that is a... Oh, wow, sick. that's... I'm See, at that's 500. what it should be like when the geese are on the bridge. I am at 500, but I'm going to go... I'm going to go beyond the adequate capacity for moving an orange bar. I'm going to go to <laughs> 600. People nope. listening on Spotify, you, you, you're you not missing anything right now. <laughs> We're perfectly honest. This is, this is the most mundane thing to get excited about, where we've decided that we can actually speed up some of the animated graphics. Watch this. On our Watch frame. this. Watch this when I introduce the minus sign. Oh! They're going the other way. <laughs> I've reversed the polarity. Are we going back in time right now? Is that what this is? <laughs> I've reversed. Back I've before re the tangents. Are we going to be talking about Picard season three at the end of this episode? <laughs> I'm going to have <laughs> curtains and a denim shirt. Um, gonna... <laughs> My God, I'm going to think I'm straight. <laughs> no. Let's not go that uh, far back. <laughs> but... uh, 46. 40... There we go. Normality is 46, restored. there we go. 46. I still hate that orange bar. Fuck you, orange bar. I'm going to change anyway. the colour just for you. Um, <laughs> yes, this has been this week's Trekking Up North. Thank you. So, so much. So, 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 so much. So much. <laughs> is, that, is that another uh, nurse on the Enterprise? Sorry. I'm, I'm glitching. Thank you so much to everyone who has joined in on the premiere in the live chat. I see you, Christopher. I've still not forgiven you. Um, thank you I to see everybody. you, Lee, shaking that ass. Hmm. I see you, Mark. <laughs> yes, you there, lurking. <laughs> Um, thank you to everyone who comments on the videos. Uh, I do pay attention to the comments and they really do mean a lot. They help on the algorithm. Do you know what else helps on the algorithm? Clicking that like button. That little like button down there. Where is Click it. it. Oh. Tick the bell. Right, right there. I don't know Tickle where it is. I can't, I can't see look, it. Look where I'm pointing. Look where I'm pointing. Oh. Look where, There you go. No, no, no. There you are. Yeah. Where Wait. Ogawa is. Oh, hello, Click. Ogawa. Tickle Ogawa. Um, Tickle again. Go on. Give Ogawa a little bit of a tickle. Mm. Ca Caress Ogawa. Um, <laughs> to say that you like this video, because that helps the algorithm as well. If you are not a subscriber to Nerdy Up North, are you ill? Have you taken Maxi Goose? <laughs> are you ill? We can't, we can't suggest people are mentally unwell purely because they haven't subscribed. Yes, I but can. But we will. Yes, I can. <laughs> the, the solution is thus. One, Maxi Goose. Two, Maxi Goose. Subscribe to the Nerdy Up North channel. If they've got this you. far and they're not, you know, and they don't like us, then they probably are mentally unwell. They're, <laughs> they're hate, literally just. They hate. I fucking passionate. hear this, but yeah. I'll watch it. <laughs> you are you. You have got the patience. I find my dad with everything. Actually, my dad's like that way. He just he genuinely just hates stuff. And then I'm like, why don't you turn it off? And he's like, because I'm invested now. <laughs> and it's like, they have okay. got the patience of a points of view viewer. <clears throat> um. Please, please subscribe before I die. Please subscribe. Come on. Subscribe Tobacco to the podcast. Is a lot of fun. Please subscribe to the... <laughs> please subscribe to the Nerdy Up North podcast. We work very hard to bring you content for everybody. If you are not a trekker, why are you watching this? Do you like monsters? No, not them monsters. No, we're not on about <laughs> Philip Schofield this week. 
We <laughs> we do ones about universal monsters, movie monsters, scary monsters, monsters from the X Files, perhaps Prince Andrew. We never know. <laughs> we do those types of monsters. Free Kate. We. Do... <laughs> Oh no! Seriously, this this nearly got talked about at the beginning because we were talking about it off off camera. But it's we blame Kate. I I don't give a shit about the royal family. Okay, like no. obviously Prince Andrew being a nonce, fun, blah blah blah. But it's the idea of like I have a mate of mine who is obsessed with this whole Kate Middleton going missing thing. But it means I have to hear about it, and oh. I genuinely don't give a shit. I'm genuinely like, oh, she might be dead. Doesn't really change my life, does it? You know, it's like, and she's like, but, but, but the royal family. And you're just like, I, no, Look, I just, I, I, the only thing that annoys me is that she's the only one that's dead, I think. But it's, but, but like the fact of like, I just went down a deep dive because I was at a wedding, I was at a wedding on Tuesday and she was there and she literally the just grabbed me. No, all right. <laughs> Mystery solved. <laughs> there we go. Oh, it's okay. well, she's behind the fucking sofa cushions with Spock. I would have got away with she's... it if it wasn't for you meddling kids. <laughs> you meddling Vulcans. But um, but no, that well, actually, to be fair, Torek would totally sus where Kate is. Oh, within yeah, they, they'd be like, no, yeah. no, we're hiding her for media purposes and whatnot. And he's just like, well, actually, logically. why am I firing a phaser at this Mercedes? Never mind. <laughs> um... <Fuck laughs> hell. Okay, Chris, there is your Photoshop. There is your Photoshop for this. Oh. Week. <laughs> That's what happened to Kate. Just saying it. But um, yeah, but but no. And she grabbed me at the wedding and just data dumped all of the stuff oh. that's happened in the last two weeks on me. And I'm just like, and I still haven't processed it. It's still literally rendering in the back of my mind this information about apparently Williams having an affair. And apparently he's we had a mistress for like 10 years and they're trying to push Kate out of the picture and Apparently she was nasty to Megan and the media have turned on her. And and I'm just like, I have never been so full of things I don't care about in a long time. <laughs> that's all, go, that's right? all I've got. That That is my okay, opinion. That's it. Okay. You can go now, Vault Boy. <laughs> yes, go. Thank you, Daddy. Get out of the frame. <laughs> Am I in the frame? I'm terribly sorry. I just want to... I, oh, wait. Hello. Yeah, anyway, that was my rant about fucking this Kate Middleton bullshit. Um, like it's, yes. it's all so, fine. Care about the royal family. Just don't bother me with it. Uh, and fuck the Tories. Anyway, mm. next week, Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock. <laughs> be there or be square. Until then, I have been Captain Goodwill. He has been... A man with no hair. Quite accurate, really. Uh, <laughs> until Fucking next hell. week. I had it. I, I had it where I was at the drag. I was the guest judge for the drag idol semi-finals on Sunday, and the amount of bald jokes. Like the contestants were just ripping it out of me for being bald, and we we had it where one of the contestants basically gave me a wig, and they made me put a wig on. So I was just sitting there with this massive wig on. We don't. We it don't. Was, oh. We don't talk about sunoids and red wigs. So. <laughs> Until until next week, my lovelies, stay safe, look after each other, live long and prosper, and remember, Miles, Miles, <laughs> Miles, Miles, sell him, sell him, Miles, sell him. Oh, oh there oh, you he's are. In the, he's in the he's in the sofa with Kate and Spock. I I found Kate. Oh.